It would be difficult to think of a field in science and technology in which advances are not taking place. And in some cases, they're going to change the world in ways as yet undreamt of. And we should be ready. A focus on the deep future that is beyond, let's say, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, uh, is really essential, I think, to uh, life continuing on the planet. For example, if we had unlimited computing power, we could solve cancer overnight. If we had unlimited computing power, we could look very, very deeply into the universe and we could make some educated guesses about where we came from, where we're going, and how to continue existing on this very small petri dish that we live on. And that's what Starlab is trying to do. When I first arrived at Starlab and wondered what Starlab was, I asked a few questions. And somebody said to me, well, Starlab is a multidisciplinary research institute. It's a think tank. I said, but what is it? And they said, well, Starlab is a place where we think thoughts that haven't been thought before. We think things for the very first time. Throughout the 20th century, there have been a number of labs and a number of think tanks developed for all sorts of purposes, ranging from speculative research to actually the building of the bomb where resources have been poured towards the bringing together of brilliant brains and using their inventiveness to make new things but there was another factor that people discovered and that was serendipity the chance discovery of something that you were not in search of and it's that that is at the basis of much of what star labs trying to do just suppose that somebody would come with an idea for a laser today Nobody would support it because it's too long term and it's too hard. We would live in a society where there are no lasers, without non-invasive surgery, without PCs, without CD technology. We are just lucky that it happened accidentally. Walter de Bruyne really wanted to create a Noah's Ark peopled by very brilliant scientists, technologists from all over the world. So we brought together about 70, 80 scientists, and some of them can really be considered as top people in their respective fields. And by putting them together in one physical place, we're actually sure that ideas will spark and that new developments will come about. It's that potential for uh, interaction and combination of different fields and sectors that is really the power of Star Wars. There is a kind of a science fiction sort of feeling to a lot of the conversations we have at lunch. We have discussed teleportation, for instance, but doing a way of death. We've had conversations about the creation of life. That kind of sounds a bit weird and a bit far out, but actually it's every day as far as we're concerned. And within a very short time, it, it's going to be left behind and there's going to be something even more seemingly strange and weird. We have a guy, Sergei Krasnikov, just being brought in from St. Petersburg, specifically to work on the possibilities of time travel. 200 years ago, it seemed preposterous uh, that people could fly by airplanes, but today we see it every day. And it is possible that in 200 years more, people will get used to the idea of time travel. By creating a time machine, I don't mean anything mechanical or electronic, but something with uh, levers or wheels. It is just a region in space-time with quite unusual properties where an observer can meet his younger self. It would be equally important for physics and for us to find out that time machine is possible or that it is impossible. We only need to know if it is impossible, then why? And if it is possible, then what exactly we must do to create it? All research is, is made up of big dreams and little accomplishments. And, you know, we really are trying to design some things that will genuinely change the way you live. I'm really inspired by uh, the seashells. When you look, under a microscope at the structure, 
what you will find is that it is perfectly ordered. It's almost like bricks of a brick building being stacked one upon another. And if we could make materials the same way, we could make materials with incredible properties. But what interests me is um, how materials grow. In nature, structures self-assemble, shells self-assemble, trees self-assemble also. So why shouldn't it be possible that one day whole buildings, for example, can self-assemble? Buildings where we dictate how many windows we want, what shape of the building we want, what height we want. We just watch and the buildings grow. Doing no scientific research is simply not an option for humanity. Even if we would just live our lives and go on like this, we cannot avoid change. Change happens, the, the climate changes, our environment changes, the whole dynamics of our society changes just by the fact of being there. A single cell in the human body is as powerful, if not more powerful, than today's computers. We have proved that this is for real, this is not science fiction. And therefore, what we need to do is understand how it's wired and try to rewire it according to our specifications. One can combine parts of the cell from plants or animals with microelectronics and create new, more efficient, more versatile bioelectronic devices. That tiny circuitry could be smaller than the diameter of your hair. One of the really interesting things about Starlab is we're working in so many real breakthrough fields. You know, these are fields that right now are really in their infancy. We're working, for example, in a project that would allow scientists to visualize the human genome and understand it in ways that have not been possible before. We're also working on clothes with building computers and sensors so that the clothes would actually have an awareness of the state of the person who's wearing them. Of course, also new drugs, DNA databases, quantum computation, nanotechnology. We're developing, you know, very inexpensive, very efficient solar cells. We're faster than light travel. We're designing new ways for us to interface with the virtual world. And, uh, of course, genetics. I think it's crucial that the public understands science. One of the main reasons is because we're very afraid of what we don't understand. What's important is that human beings out there who aren't scientists find out about this stuff and that scientists express it as clearly and as comprehensively as they can. Increasingly, it's affecting people's lives very directly. The things that you eat, your health care, the way you work, the way you live, the way your children will live, uh, these things are becoming increasingly entwined with science and technology. So I think the public really understanding what are the issues, it's one of the biggest goals of the 21st century. Today's children are probably the first generation that will be able to deal with the technology that we now develop in a much better way than we can even imagine. A lot of people at Starlab have kids. We're parents. And I think that makes a difference. It makes you think in a different way. We really are thinking not just of the next generation, or even of the generation after that, but of generations and generations to come. That's what fills me with the most confidence, and that's what gives me the most cause for optimism. I want my kids to say, you know, Daddy was a rolling stone, you know?